Hey everybody, and welcome to your second lab. We realized last time that you guys were a little confused as to what was going on, and so this time we wanted to give you some context and kind of some clarity as to what's happening. We realized G-Code can be a little stressful, and I want to take the time to kind of walk you through what G-Code is, and why we use it, and what it kind of represents. The good news for you guys is that G-Code is actually really simple. It's a really straightforward programming language that's been used for a very long time in multiple forms. It has its roots really in card punches and the systems that were originally employed for very, very basic machinery. In this lab, we're going to be asking you to program at a very basic level a handful of shapes to plot with your CNC axes. Our goal for this class is to have you go out, design the shapes that you need, figure out which location or vertices you have to go to, and then program those vertices into your CNC. If everything behaves itself, you should be able to describe the motion and have your system do that motion. For those of you at home, we've decided to ensure that you guys have a similar experience. So we're sending you over a simulator file that'll actually allow you to test your code alongside your in-person peers. For those of you in person, your job is going, to be make, is going to be making sure that A, everything is plotting nicely, and B, that you get the measurements for the shapes that are plotted. If you have any questions, of course, reach out to me or the rest of the team in order to give you, yourself a hand. We really want to make sure that you guys really understand this stuff, and we want to make sure that you're having a good experience. Now, to get into G-Code, though, this is where things get a little bit furry. The background for it is probably the most important part, and it can be a little bit um, vague. Um, formally, if you're looking at G-Code, it is an entire field of coding. And I want to stress that because every single machine has a slightly different G-Code variant that it speaks. The systems that you're using are using a system which is really for kind of hobbyists. Um, it actually is processed through a very small chip and it has relatively low level control. It can control an X, Y, and Z, and it can do some fancy things involving interpolation and curves, but at the end of the day, it's a really basic controller. More complex machines are gonna have more complex codes, but those evolved over time, and realistically speaking, they all kind of have exactly the same root. To understand what I'm talking about though, we have to go a long, long way back. In 1725, uh, there was a man named Basil Bouchon who lived in France and worked on some of the uh, most, the first looms of the time, if I'm being honest with you, and so they're the first automated looms. And he created a system where a pattern could be initially uh, punched into a series of wooden uh, cards, and then they could be placed into the loom in order to change which strings were lifted or raised at any point in time to change the pattern as the string was passed back and forth. Now, this in general was considered kind of a proprietary technology until around 1802 when Joseph Marie Jacquard, um, which some of you may be familiar with a Jacquard loom, that is where that comes from, took this, took this idea and transferred it to punch cards. The idea was is that by drawing the pattern on a piece of paper and then punching out the card wherever the uh, high and low strings were supposed to be, he could fully automate the process, thus removing the complexity of making complex patterns. This was hugely beneficial and is kind of correspondent to a boom in uh, fabric patterns of that time. This is actually largely contentious and these were really, really heavily prized cards. The patterns that were used sometimes were stolen because they were so important. It was actually some of the first instances where you really see what we would consider in modern times kind of corporate espionage, where people would go and they would actually memorize the card decks so they could take it to their factory and reuse them locally. Um, Lowell actually got its start because a handful of people traveled over to Europe and learned how to create these machines from scratch and then brought them back over here in order to get our textile system started. Now, in general, this patterning system was largely in the field of textiles until around 1830, when Charles Babbage said, hey, look, we can use these for data storage, and he created the world's first analytical engine. It would be largely considered the father of modern computing in terms of how we see this, just because the overall structure of it actually allowed for pretty heavy data throughput. The idea was is that with a handful of cards, you could begin to move data in and out of a system. It wasn't until 1890, though, where Herman Hollerith actually started a company called the Compu Computing, Tabulating, and Recording Company of America, which actually they came in and they used these punch cards to start to do the U.S. Census. And they used the first electromechanical systems. That is to say that they could load the punch card in, and rather than have just a really straightforward or, or large system, there would be these large numerated punch cards. This same company, this computer, computing tabulating recording company, would later evolve in 1924 into IBM and become one of the largest powerhouses for, uh, for computing for almost half a century. And their the entire staple was, we have this card system which can store data and process calculations and assist with actually performing real-world activities. 
It isn't until a lot later, 1950 though, that we start to see any major changes in this, um, specifically regarding to uh, machine motion. The reason for this is that we were missing a critical technology, and that was called a servo motor. And what this allowed us to do was to actually prescribe a motion to a motor and have that motor go to that location. I'm not gonna get too far into it, but this technology was patented in the early, early 1900s by MIT and was later expanded out by their servo mechanics lab um, until about 1940, 1950, where they started to see uh, a shift into more industry-based applications. In the early 1950s though, there was a man named John T. Parsons who was really interested in this idea. The story behind this is a little more confusing. He was a machinist by trade, his parents owned a machine shop, and after World War II, they ended up getting one of the first contracts for making rotor blades for airplanes. One of the first 18 blades the company ever made ruptured on a maiden flight and actually killed the pilot. John T. Parsons was incredibly upset about this and wanted to come up with a better way to make rotor blades because he felt it was his company's responsibility to make a repeatable blade. He proposed a lot of potential options, and they ended up settling on the idea of stamping the blades out of a single piece of metal. But one of the things that he really wanted to do was he wanted to use these newfangled punch cards to create a system that would actually allow him to uh, repeatedly machine a, uh, a, a, a rotor blade. Um, in general, this idea stuck around, and in the later 19, mid 1950s, excuse me, he partnered with MIT and set up a joint venture to set up a machine capable of using these punch cards to make repeatable parts. Um, he actually called his design the Cardomatic, um, and this was kind of a fascinating idea. And the idea was is that it'd be this fully automated machine that you'd feed a punch card to, and it would go and do that punch card activity, and then you'd feed another punch card, and it'd go and do that activity. Um, and also, just Cardomatic's a really great, not great name. Um, he ends up getting the patent for this design, and the, the the core of this patent is the ability to drive his system using a series of threaded rods. And he actually goes ahead and designs one of the very first CNC mechanisms. Um, the machine itself was absolutely massive. It was a converted Cincinnati uh, system. It was, I think, uh, five tons, and the computer itself was the size of five large refrigerators at the time. Um, and for context, that much computing power would have probably been the equivalent of less than a four-function calculator in modern times. Um, it was just massive in order to get these things done. He ends up actually falling off the project at this point in time because MIT ends up outbidding him to the military. It becomes a whole kind of conundrum, and there's a really great uh, summary of it that I'll post on the, uh, the Blackboard so you guys can get to kind of take a look at it. He doesn't end up holding any ill will, though, and he ends up coming back to it later in order to kind of get some other pieces together. Um, in general, though, the important part of this was is that that early co uh, coding process was really straightforward. You'd walk up to the machine, and you'd effectively load a card for every action you wanted it to do. This same communication system is actually what we use today on our modern machines. This technology hasn't changed. Obviously computers have gotten easier and they've got, it's become a lot faster to load those cards in the machine because we load them in a stack as a file rather than trying to do them individually. But at the end of the day, the core of these components is effectively identical. Now I wanna stress that Parsons did live on to move and kind of affect how we handle uh, what we would call uh, MC control for the rest of his life. He was actually, uh, he passed away only in 2007, so it was, he, he lived until relatively recently, and he was awarded multiple high-level awards for his work, and he was actually in, inducted into the Patent Hall of Fame uh, very early in the 2000s for the work that he ended up doing here. Um, so he lived, a, he lived a great life doing this stuff. It was really kind of his passion project for a very long time. Um, but the core of this system really is just punch cards. And for context for how this worked, what would end up happening was is you would come in, Get rid of that window capture. There we go. You would come in and you would see, uh, the first thing you'd need to know is, is kind of where is my origin? And so you'd set your origin for your components, all right? And you'd feed it a punch card that said, hey, this is where you are. The next thing you'd do is you'd say, hey, I want this system to go to some new location. So you'd give it a set, another set of coordinates, and then you'd tell it how quickly to get there. We would refer to this as moving with some feed or some fee speed in order to get to some location. You'd then iterate on this every single time, adding an additional command to move to some location, and then again, and again, and again, until finally the part was done and you'd sever the communication with the machine and tell it to go home. This same process, each instruction was handled by a single card. Now, we live in modern times, so we're doing this a little bit differently. For the purposes of your class, we're gonna be using MATLAB to pass these cards to the system. Each line of code represents a specific set of instructions to move forward. Now, while the very early code in this, uh, specifically at, at the very start of this, is a connection block, so it's really us talking to the machine, the rest of the codes follow the exact same logic. The first line of code is telling the machine where it is and how it's going to handle its day. 
Those G commands are actually just setting up the origin and explaining how it's working. The next code that you're going to be sending is going to be telling it to move to one inch at a feed rate of 20 inches per minute. Now, every machine has a slightly different behavior and feed rate. Obviously, there's metric values. Um, but at the end of the day, this is all exactly the same as the, as the core system, except instead of a punch card, we're sending an individual line of code. The next line of code in this system would tell it to go back to the origin or move back to x equals zero at the same 20 inch per minute rate. And then the final line of code is closing the connection to the system and ending the program. In your cases, the only thing that's different is going to be this fprintf, which is really just MATLAB's way of saying, send this line of code. So when you're writing these programs, keep in mind that all you have to do in order to get this to behave itself is to imagine each line of code as an individual phrase to the machine. Don't think of it as a whole, think of it as a single line that's telling the machine to do something. Now, in the real world, we never do this. I wanna stress, I write G-code all the time and I never do it by hand. And the reason for that is it's incredibly time consuming. Modern machines have not only G-code, they have M-code and N-code and, and J-code and I-code and K-code and N-code and I believe there's L code now, um, and there's O codes depending on the machine that you're working with. Each of these have their own language and their own specific specificity as to how to do that. And so to fix that, what we'll oftentimes do is we will use what is called a post processor, uh, which will actually filter a command from a program and turn it into the specific language for that machine. I personally own a Haas, and so what I tend to do is I tend to be using their commands, and I can identify a handful of them just by looking at them directly. I can tell you that the M11 command is going to turn on my coolant. And I know this because having pressed the M11 command accidentally, I have worn about a gallon and a half of coolant. For context though, every single one of these codes isn't always clear to me. I sometimes have to look them up also. And in general, I trust the software to do it. I don't write it by hand, and instead I really focus on using software like this, which actually allows me to see where the machine is going, and then it will go ahead and do that plotting for me. For the purposes of your lab today, I really want to stress this, you are not trying to write a complex program. We'd like you to draw a square, a triangle, and a little plus shape, all right? as well as any shapes that you think would be fun to add to your process. If you can write the code for those systems, and remember it's just going to consist of telling the machine to go from the point that you're at to the next point, and then so on and so forth until you've drawn the shape that you need, all you need to do is measure how accurately the machine replicated that, and then collect that data. The goal of this lab is really just to kind of have some fun with this. And I want you guys to really focus in on how do we write these lines of code and why does this matter? The last thing I'm gonna to add, to, add to this entire kind of lecture bit that's gonna be added to this, this, uh, this video is I wanna stress that the X and the A axis matter, all right? The machines that we're working with do not have a very strong X axis. So we partner it with an A axis that moves in parallel with that system. So if you're going to ask the X axis to go to three inches, you have to ask the A axis to go to three inches at the same time. If you don't do that, the machine will actually just move the X axis independently. And as a result of that, you won't get the shape that you're looking for. So make sure to include that in your code. Additionally, because you have the simulators, you will be able to test your code in advance. But as a reminder, it will not be to COM3. Instead, it'll just be to the serial communication line that's included in the example code. I know this is a lot, and I look forward to seeing what you guys end up drawing for me. So feel free to flag me down if you have any questions, or flag down Dr. K if you have any questions, and we look forward to what you guys end up drawing and seeing your reports. As a reminder, two days after this lecture, we're going to be asking you to submit all of your figures and tables so we can take a look at them and make sure you're heading in the right direction. A week after this, we're going to ask that you do a write-up that includes a discussion and a results section explaining how accurately your CNC blocks replicated the code that you wrote. The goal is not to have a super, super detailed report as much as having some nice data that you can compare it to and say, hey, we see that there's some patterns here and we think there may be something going on. If you can figure out what those things are, we'll be very excited to take a look at them. Again, any questions, flag us down. We look forward to talking to you.